I'm George Galloway, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free work. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing the United States of America. Twelve months, Donald J. Trump has been the most powerful man in the world. I predicted that he would win the presidency publicly many times. And I said at the beginning of his presidency that while I was not happy that he was the president, I was very happy indeed that Hillary Clinton wasn't. And I still cling to that position. I do believe that if Hillary Clinton had been successful in the election against Donald Trump, that we would almost certainly be at war in Syria and maybe elsewhere too in the Ukraine and other places. So I'm not resiling from the position that I took but having said that, Donald Trump has either backtracked, reversed, or completely failed to follow through on the major reasons why people voted for him to be the president. He said that he was going to reset relations with Russia, but 12 months on, relations with Russia are far worse than they were when his predecessor left office. And the United States is gripped in a Russophobic phobia, which God knows where it's going to end. No one has seen anything like this in the US since the 1950s and the height of the McCarthyite period. Donald Trump said that he would give up the United States interference in other people's domestic affairs. Well, that problem uh, has intensified too. He said he had no interest in regime change in Syria, but he's still trying to bring about regime change in Syria, even now that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are largely defeated on the battlefield. He has effectively declared war on Iran, whilst Iran has entirely respected the international agreement with the permanent five plus one on the nuclear file, the United States has ripped the file up. And it's by no means certain that there will not be a hot shooting war involving the United States and its allies and Iran. And talking of its allies, Donald Trump has allied himself with the medieval despotism of Saudi Arabia in a way that even his slavish pro-Saudi predecessors would have balked at. He has endorsed a coup inside the country which has led to a 31-year-old man grabbing virtually all power, arresting hundreds of his own family members and a variety of plutocrats. Not that I'm crying into my tea about their fate, but it's the pot calling the kettle black, in my opinion. And again talking about the United States allies in the region, the provocative, incendiary, insane act of recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, moving the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and crowing and boasting about it as Jewish people everywhere uh, began the celebration uh, of Hanukkah is uh, a, a dangerous step almost beyond belief. So much so that even all of America's allies, including the United Nations, which it dominates, have all condemned this move. It's such a provocative move that it could almost not be overestimated in the seriousness of the challenge which it now poses. 
it brings to an end the idea that there was any kind of Middle East peace process. It brings to an end any idea that Palestine could be re-stabilized along a two-state solution. In the Ukraine, the uh, propaganda and material support for the coup government in Kiev has been intensified under Donald Trump. So all over the world we see serious problems in just 12 months of Donald Trump's presidency. But undoubtedly the most dangerous of them all is that on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Trump on Twitter, let me say that again, Trump on Twitter has almost daily been provoking the North Korean leadership into what might turn out to be not just war but nuclear war. North Korea is in possession of nuclear weapons. It has the ballistic missile capability of firing those weapons out of the atmosphere, back into the atmosphere and onto the American mainland itself. The Trump administration is declaring, as I say, almost daily that this is a situation up with which they will not put. And any day you could wake up to learn that Donald Trump and the United States has launched an attack on North Korea. If they do, North Korea will invade South Korea. North Korea will attack uh, with uh, missiles, almost certainly nuclear, Japan at least, and Guam at least. In those circumstances, the United States would retaliate with nuclear weapons on the border of China and Russia. Just begin to calibrate the dangers in that scenario that I have just described. Finally, Donald Trump has utterly failed the blue-collar workers in the Rust Belt of the United States who voted for him in unprecedented numbers. Not since Ronald Reagan in the 1980s have so many working-class people voted for the Republican candidate in the presidency. And the reason they did so was that Trump promised that he would make America great again, that he would end the neoliberal policies of decades since Bill Clinton uh, at least of exporting jobs of so-called free trade agreements which beggared the American working class. Trump promised to end all that but none of it has ended and none of it is going to end. On top of all that he's given all his billionaire friends super tax cuts so that they can become even richer. He has destroyed that minuscule achievement of Barack Obama's presidency of introducing Obamacare which gave some limited health care protection to some of America's people that were otherwise without it. So if I was making this a school report card it would be D minus for Donald Trump. It would be must try harder unless you're going to get expelled from the school long before the end of next term. Now I have an audience here of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs, the most distinguished of whom is the twice mayor of London, my old friend Ken Livingston. Ken. I think what's interesting is that everything you've said is true and we just had the election in Alabama where for the first time in 25 years a Democrat defeated the Republican. And I wonder to what extent some of those angry white working class people who've seen their living standards diminished ever since Reagan have decided they don't trust him anymore and then that sort of shift. And that, that I think is damning. I think as well there's an underlying debate in the establishment in America which identifies their biggest threat is China 
And Obama was deeply involved in all of this, trying to strike alliances and to get a ring of um, nations around China that would be hostile. He wanted that trade policy for the Pacific, which would exclude China. And I think the fear Americans' establishment has is that China will soon overtake America to be the world's largest economy. And what the American establishment want is that, as they had through the Cold War, that America is the dominant superpower of the world. Well, that world's coming to an end. Not just China will overtake America, eventually India will. We're moving into a world in which no one nation is going to dominate it like Britain used to in the, the 19th century and America did in the 20th. And so the whole hysteria about that going on. And the trouble is someone like Trump, I mean, I don't think has the intellectual ability to see a, a grand view about uh, the decades to come. And I think all the, the things you mentioned, the risk of a war with Korea, a involvement anywhere else, invading and so on, all those are very great dangers that um, we live with every day. And I'm just praying now that this will just be a one-term president. One term, maybe less than uh, one term. Uh, let me ask you about that. The deep state in the United States, the CIA, the FBI, the uh, various uh, intelligence organizations, the State Department and so on, and of course a huge swathe of the American media has never accepted Trump's presidency and has been seeking to undermine and potentially overthrow him from the beginning. Do you think that's one of the reasons why his first year has been so bad? Might it have been different if his presidency had been accepted by the various organs of the American state? I can't think of any president who's had such sort of disloyalty from I mean, the, the, the FBI, the CIA and so on. Nixon, after, what, six years, was finally thrown out of office. But he had total support from the establishment all the way through at the beginning. And I think... A lot of people in the American establishment who have no sympathy with anything you or I believe in, they fear they have an erratic man in control, that he could actually damage America, undermine it with mad gestures and things like that. And so I think if they can find some evidence of corruption in the election, and don't get I mean, Hillary Clinton won three million more votes than Donald Trump. I mean, they talk about America as a great democracy. It does seem to me the person who gets most votes, I mean, he normally should win. Um, so I, I think there's a real chance, particularly if there's a big surge and democratic gains a year from now in the midterm elections, and you could have a Democrat majority in the Senate who have the power to remove the president. I mean, I can only think, I think it was about, uh, 1867 or something, the Senate tried to remove the successor to uh, Abraham Lincoln and failed by just one vote. So there's the possibility of doing that. Now, finally, you were the first, finest, twice uh, mayor of London. Donald Trump is headed this way, according to this morning's uh, newspapers. It'll be a, a swift, uh, low-key working visit. Uh, what do you think the challenges uh, to London's authorities will be given the likely public reaction to Donald Trump being here. Let's remember when uh, George Bush came to Britain after he had conducted the invasion of Iraq. I, we helped I mean, from City Hall the demonstrations at Trafalgar Square. I may, you may, may not remember now, but they created a, a big sort of statue of um, George Bush, and then pulled, pulled it, it down, down. Yes. just like had happened, uh, of course, in Iraq. Um, so I think there'll be huge demonstrations, and I'm sure we'll be on them. Indeed. Thank you very much, Ken Livingston. Uh, Alexander Nekrasov, you were a former advisor at the Kremlin. You're a foreign policy expert. Uh, to what do you attribute the U-turns uh, in Donald Trump's foreign policy, first of all? Well, I think that um, his U-turns are all uh, the result of his playing his own game. He realized that he has to change. He realized that his um, personal interests, in, in a certain way, were um, affected by the deep state, as you pointed out, uh, resistance to him. Now, I would like to make one point about the deep state, by the way. Um, Trump is a shrewd businessman, 
and he knows how to conduct you know negotiations and what to do now i think he played his cards very cunningly by um, basically buying up the military you know when he was uh, elected he started saying we must give more money to the military and 55 billion suddenly he found somewhere and i think the military are behind him i think he is placing his bets on the military and this is why i suspect he might survive for a time being and he might even go into the next term because you must understand in america this is huge we're not talking about the military in europe or even in russia or china this is a country within a country the military has more intelligence services than the CIA, FBI, and others. It can produce this power, not just in America, around America, across the world. So that, I think, is his game. And this is a personal game. This is his personal interest. Now, when it comes to Russia, my personal opinion is that Trump, when he was saying that during the election campaign, did not really plan to be friends with Russia. He said it just because he wanted to have an argument against Hillary Clinton, who was seen as an enemy of Russia. He said it because the major plan that Trump's administration has, and I must remind all of you here who his Secretary of State is, Rex Tillerson. The major plan is to attack China and with energy. And that is why he was talking about Russia as if he was planning to do, he become friendly. He wants to cut off China from everywhere. And this is why well, this attack on Qatar, for example. He wants to cut off Qatar because the gas is flowing to China. He wants to cut off Iran because there are links with China. He wants to weaken Russia because the energy flows into China. Look at North Korea and the crisis there. That is an attack on China as well. So he's trying to surround China, and that's his main target. And Rex Tillerson should tell all of you what they are doing. Rex Tillerson, the former head, of course, of Exxon Mobil, uh, the biggest oil man in the world. Uh, it's no accident that he was made the Secretary of State, is it? Well, obviously, Exxon Mobil is, again, a state within a state that has its own intelligence, it has its own private army, it has its own people everywhere. So we must look at Trump as basically the president of the oil sector of the energy industry. And I, I would caution people from thinking that this silly notion, oh, he won because he used the social media. Oh, he won because he was this and that. There were serious people behind him with serious money. And this is why he won. Not, obviously, we have to remember that Hillary Clinton was the worst possible candidate. And I sometimes say probably a baboon would have won the, the elections if the Democrats put up a baboon against him. But they made an absolutely hideous mistake of putting her up. And uh, I think that's the main reason. And, and to talk about Russia supporting Trump, well, I can tell you that I've known the feelings in the Kremlin before the election, and there was absolutely no idea that he will win. So to think that Russia was supporting an underdog, why would they do that? It, it is absolutely insane. And this Russia gate, which is going on and on and on, and producing absolutely no evidence, it is becoming a farce. It is, it is making America look stupid. I'm sorry I'm saying this. And uh, the latest development, again, proof, They've got nothing, zero, and they're trying to find more and more and more, and it's moving even to Britain now. They're investigating whether Brexit was the result of Russian involvement. Which you I must feel very powerful. You're, <laughs> you're, you're influencing events in Catalonia, in Scotland, in Brexit, in the Netherlands, I see today, uh, in the Atlantic Council. Uh, the Italian elections are going to be fixed by you. The American election was fixed by you. Speaking as uh, someone who supported the Soviet Union, I wish you had that kind of reach back then. <laughs> well, I must say to you that uh, you know the, Putin has announced his uh, plans to get re-elected next year in March. 
and he doesn't even need a campaign to run because all the facts are in his favor. You know, the Americans are accusing him of things that he's so powerful, everyone basically, all the West. So in this sense, he is not He's not even bothered, I think, by, by, by any campaigning. So yes, it, it, it does look bizarre. It does look very strange. And I think one of the reasons why we see this anti-Russian campaign, amongst other things, obviously, among political things, is that it's something that in the West is not accepted publicly, but there is a serious economic crisis going on. And what I find remarkable is that we have these old statistics about you know, rise of GDP, unemployment supposedly down, and so on, and yet the standards of living of millions are going through the floor. And that, I think, demands that the media in the West and the governments and the propaganda, they find an enemy and they start blaming someone for their own mistakes. Mm. That is why I think we will see the continuation of this anti-Russian campaign because they have to hide their own problems, mistakes, and basically mismanagement of mm. the economy. Mm. You see, if I say, look over there, all of you will do so and just did so. Look over there is always the first response of the charlatan seeking to avoid attention. This is Kali Mahorra. That's the end of the first segment. Much more still to come. in London talking about Donald Trump 12 months after he took office. We took the Kalamahora camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought of Donald J. Trump. Take a look at this. How did Trump's presidency affect the world? Oh God. If he doesn't bring us to World War III, well, five, 15 pounds on the table, he's going to bring us to World War III. He was really stupid by saying something and then everyone is back fighting and it was, they were like friends, fine with each other, the Palestinians with the, and now they are back on fighting, so he's a silly man. He lacks uh, diplomatic skills and that probably can be a risky move for the world, having a president with so much power that uh, can do so many uh, things that affect and impact the world. It seems like he's not afraid of anything and he's in a position where he should think twice, maybe, um, his actions. Uh, so I think how it affects the world, not in a very positive way, I'd say. Do you think that there were other forces at play uh, that are more interested in him becoming president and uh, controlling him? Uh, he just recognized Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel, uh, so my answer would be yes. Do you think that that was a good decision, a bad decision? Worst decision possible ever. So do you think that Russia had a, a say in him being elected? Yes. I don't know how, but I guess it has something to do because they are a a really powerful nation, so something they had to do. Well, that was uh, the voice of the people in London, uh, certainly not complimentary about the President of the United States as someone who has spent his entire life trying to rally people in Britain to stop looking to America as their leader, uh, still less their father. Donald Trump is a bit of a gift. Anti-Americanism is quite an easy sell now in Britain. But you do have to uh, make this cautionary uh, stop. This is a sophisticated European vox pop, and they regard Trump as something akin to a monster or a clown or a mixture of both. But that's not how he's seen amongst one third, at least, of the American population. That means a hundred million Americans or more don't see him 
in the way that he's seen uh, in Europe and I dare say in other parts of the world. I need to make that point just in case Donald Trump doesn't <coughs> have any supporters here in the audience tonight. Naja Ali, are you a supporter of Donald Trump? الرئيس ترامب وأعتقد أيضا أن شعبيته انخفضت كثيرا في السنة الأولى يعني هناك مراكز دراسات أمريكية تقول أن شعبيته انخفضت كثيرا وهذا طبعا تعرف جيدا يعني السنة الأولى للرؤساء الأمريكيين تعتبر سنة مهمة جدا وهي معيار على نجاحه في السنوات المقبلة في الغالب الرؤساء الأمريكيون تنخفض شعبيتهم في السنة الثامنة يعني إذا جددت لهم الولاية ولاية ثانية لكن ترامب انخفضت شعبيته في السنة الأولى هذا يعني أننا مقبلون على المزيد من الهزائم للرئيس الأمريكي ترامب في المستقبل وأعتقد أيضا أن الرئيس ترامب أن تتحدث عن الدولة العميقة أنا أعتقد أنه يمثل الدولة العميقة يحظى بتعييد الدولة العميقة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية خصوصا لوبي المال ولوبي السلاح لكنه ربما يخطئ في كيفية التعامل مع خصوصا منطقة الشرق الأوسط روسيا كوريا الشمالية وهذا يتعارض مع مصالح الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لاحظنا خسارته الكبيرة فيما يتعلق بسوريا سوريا تحديدا تمثل نقطة الهزيمة الكبرى للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية في عهد ترامب وبالعكس تمثل أيضا نجاحا كبيرا وباهرا للسياسة الروسية وللرئيس الروسي فلاديمير بوتين لاحظنا بعد الست سنوات من الحرب العالمية على سوريا أول رئيس يصل إلى سوريا هو الرئيس الروسي فلاديمير بوتين في الوقت الذي لازلنا نشاهد تخبطا وسياسة عبثية من الرئيس ترامب حول سوريا وفيما يتعلق بإيران وهذه النقطة المهمة التي أود أن أشير لها ترامب صحيح يريد أن يتخلى عن الاتفاق النووي لكن مجرد التصريح بأنه يريد التخلي عن الاتفاق النووي الذي هو اتفاق دولي لا يخص الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وإيران فقط بل يخص الدول خمسة زائد واحد مجرد أن يتحدث عن رغبته في التخلص من هذا الاتفاق النووي هذا يعني أن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لا يمكن الوثوق بها على الإطلاق في المستقبل وهذا يعني أيضا أن إيران نجحت في إثبات مقولة الإمام الخمين الراحل أن أمريكا هي الشيطان الأكبر لأنه عدم الوثوق بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية سيعزز في 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 الجهة الأخرى من قدرة أولئك الذين في إيران لا يزالون يعتقدون بأن أمريكا هي الشيطان الأكبر. شيطان أكبر. I think we all understood even without translation. وأيضا فيما يعني كان يفترض أنا 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 كنت أعتقد كخبير في الشؤون الإيرانية. كنت أعتقد ولدي كانت معلومات أن هذا الاتفاق النووي سيفضي في النهاية إلى تحسين العلاقات الإيرانية الأمريكية صحيح أن المرشد علي خامنئي كان وضع خطا أحمر فيما يتعلق بالعلاقات مع واشنطن لكني واثق تماما أنه إذا نجحت إيران مع الدول خمسة زائد واحد في تخطي عقبة ترامب وعقبة الاتفاق النووي من الممكن أن أن يحصل انفراج في العلاقات بين واشنطن وطهران، لكن ترامب هو الذي يقوض مثل هذه الآمال بتوجهه المباشر إلى المملكة العربية السعودية التي تريد بأي شكل من الأشكال تقويض هذا الاتفاق النووي. I just I have a question. Um, it's hard to see what the American policy in Syria is. Uh, the State Department reiterated the position that President Assad uh, must go. Uh, there is no future for him. Even though he's obviously not going, he's obviously the main victor of the war, which has come more or less to an end. What is the point of American demands that Assad must go when that demand clearly is not going to be Achieved. لا كانت هناك رسائل متناقضة يعني في البداية حصل هناك 
نيويوركر مجلة نيويوركر الأمريكية نقلت عن مصادر أمريكية وأوروبية قولها أن الإدارة الأمريكية لا تعارض بقاء الرئيس بشار الأسد لكن بعد هذا التصريح جاءت التناقضات مرة أخرى أنا أقول أن السياسة الأمريكية متناقضة ومتضاربة في سوريا هم الآن فشلوا في أن أن يزيحوا الرئيس بشار الأسد عن طريق الحرب يعني أكثر من من مئة دولة ساهمت في إيجاد داعش ومنظمات إرهابية فقط تركيا فقط تركيا تدعم يعني وفق اتفاق الأستان وفق مؤتمر الأستانا تركيا ترعى باعتبارها ضابنة مئة واثنين منظمة إرهابية قاتلت في سوريا الحرب فشلت في إزاحة الرئيس بشار الأسد فكيف يستطيع ترامب بالدبلوماسية أن يزيح بشار الأسد وبشار الأسد الآن منتصر الإيرانيون حلفاؤه منتصرون الرئيس بوتين ذهب بنفسه إلى القاعدة الروسية في اللاذقية والتقى بشار في رسالة واضحة إلى أن الرئيس بشار باق حتى في الحديث عن مؤتمر سوشي وعما يعني هناك بعض التسريبات تحدثت أنه بالإمكان أن يرأس المؤتمر الحكومي الروسي السيد فاروق الشرع أيضا الروس نفوا ذلك علنا قالوا نو no واي يعني لا يمكن لأحد أن يحل محل الرئيس بشار الأسد في الوقت الحاضر تحديدا أوكي هو أس ود لايك تو سبيك مدام سامية الحسيني مدرسة وناشطة عالمية بحب أضيف لرأي الأستاذ نجاح بحب أقول أنه كمان أنا بقول أنه شعبية ترامب انخفضت وأنا ما بوافق الرأي أنه هي بعد بريطانيا تعتبره رجل عظيم أو سوري أمريكا دولة عظمى بوجوده لأنه كما قال انطلاقته كانت بداية غلط يعني خلال هذه السنة ما أثبت للعالم أنه هو عم ينجز أشياء لصالح اليونايتد لصالح أمريكا ونحن كلنا الكل يعلم أنه النقطة الأساس هي الاقتصاد والحرب السياسية التي يخوضها ترامب خسرت مع روسيا مع كوريا حتى شعبيته في الدول الأوروبية انخفضت, انخفضت كثيرا فنراه خسر الحرب في العراق الكل الآن أنتم تتحدثون عن سوريا والنقطة الأهم والأساس هي العراق هنا عندما خسر الحرب في العراق وهو كان يعتقد أن المنفذ الرئيس له هو من خلال العراق كردستان الأردن فلسطين من خلال إسرائيل سوريا من خلال تعامله مع مع خلال اتحاده مع الإسرائيليين ولكن عندما خسر هذا المنفذ ونفذت شعبيته وأفلس نهائيا ماذا لجأ؟ لجأ إلى إعلان القدس عاصمة لإسرائيل ولذلك ليلفت الانتباه له وليعمل ضجة أخرى في العالم وأنه يحقق شيئا الربح الوحيد الذي ربحه ترامب خلال هذه السنة هو ما جناه من السعودية 460 مليار دولار فقط جناها من السعودية هذا هو الربح الوحيد الذي جناه خلال هذا العام ولكن سياسيا اقتصاديا لم يجني أي ربح آخر وكلنا يعلم أنه ليس رجل سياسة إنه رجل أعمال فقط ورجل كان للتلفزيون للميديا لهذه الأشياء وليس للسياسة كل الرؤساء استمروا لدورة ثانية في أمريكا أو أكثر ولكن لا أعتقد أنه قد يكمل الدورة الأولى من حكمه في الرئاسة الأمريكية Even the uh, Kurdish gamble has failed uh, The Kurdish uh, area declared itself independent from Iraq It was immediately confronted by closed borders and by absolute uh, hostility from Turkey, Iran and Iraq. Uh, and it seems to have died uh, a death. So the Kurdish card that they played has also foundered, hasn't it? Yes. Uh, but I want to add a point to Trump. It's true that he... جعل القدس عاصمة لإسرائيل ولكن في نفس الوقت 
أنا أشكره لأنه ذكر بعض الزعماء العرب بوجود دولة بوجود فلسطين التي هي قبلة المسلمين الأولى هذه القدس قبلة المسلمين الأولى قبل أن تكون عاصمة لإسرائيل وكيف لترامب أن يد أن أن يجعل لإسرائيل عاصمة وهي أساسا ليست دولة إسرائيل بالأساس ليست دولة فكيف يجعل لها عاصمة وهي القدس يجعل عاصمة ل لإسرائيل هنا أريد أن أشكره لأنه ربما يعني قد يصح العرب قد يصح بعض الزهماء لأنه لن يبقى في كافة الأرض الآن المقاومة تطالب بمليون شهيد للذهاب إلى القدس لتحريرها أنا أشكره لأنه يعني سيجعل صحوة ونهضة كبرى ربما في بعض الدول العربية Chairman Mao Zedong once said that sometimes the enemy struggles mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on its own feet. There's much more of this after the break. You're watching Callum O'Hara with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin, coming to you from London, discussing Donald Trump. We took the Callum O'Hara camera onto the streets of London. Let's see what the people had to say. Do you think that Trump made America great again, as he promised? No. No. I don't think he has. He's doing things like really wrong. He's putting people against people, living with Russia, supporting who bad, bad man like Putin. So he's not doing great. No. And uh, well, he doesn't respect any promises because uh, we are just dead. America will only be great again when it turns back to being a Christian country that it once was. Um, at the moment, the Christian church is in turmoil in America, and when they repent of it and come back to the Bible, then America will be great again. And do you think that Trump made America great again? Absolutely not. Um, I think he has uh, sold the slogan of I'm going to make America great again. And because of the crisis America lived for many years, and all those industries like the car industry and other industries, in the, especially in the middle of the country, has been affected and so many people unemployed, they have trusted him. Um, and probably he's going to do good things for America. Uh, I'm not saying everything he does is wrong. He's probably going to do good things for, for them. Uh, but I don't think America, I think America is becoming more of a target or some a country that is not as attractive or as nice as it used to be so no i don't think it's making america great again uh well not the uh most fulsome supporters uh, of donald trump the londoners so if he does come to london anytime soon he's not likely to get a very warm welcome let's continue with the debate yes sir the floor is yours شكرا سيد جلوي طبعا تعريجا على كلام الإخوة السابقين البعض عرج على النجاحات الروسية مقابل الإخفاقات الأمريكية في سياسة هذا الرجل ترامب ولكن أنا سأعرج على يعني على قرارات الأمم المتحدة والتي يعني تم اختراقها بالوعد الجديد بعد مئة عام من وعد بريطانيا الصهيونية العالمية بمنحهم أرض بفلسطين جاء بعد مئة عام في العام 1917 كان وعد بالفور في العام 2017 كان وعد ترامب وبالتالي الاعتراف بإسرائيل كعاصمة للكيان الصهيوني أو للدولة اليهودية كما يحلو لهم أن يسمونها أه لو أنا نحكي عن القدس صحيح ولكن أنا بدي أعرج على شيء واحد أنه لو رجعنا بعد 12 شهر من انتخاب هذا الترامب ودققنا في الحملة الانتخابية التي كان يقودها لو لاحظنا هو حكى في شغلتين أو أعطى وعدين 
اللي هو السور على حدود المكسيك وايضا نقل السفاره الاسرا الامريكيه من تل ابيب الى القدس وبالتالي تحدث السيد هنا بان ترامب هو ليس ارعا هناك بعض الرجال يعملون في الخلف واعتقد ليس رجال بل منظمات يعني مدعومة دوليا ومن ضمنها اللي هو اللوبي الصهيوني المؤثر في القرار الأمريكي البعض قال سيخطئ أو لربما لن يتعدى ترامب أو يسقط في فترته الأولى كما نيكسون وكثير من اللي هو الرؤساء الأمريكيين أنا أعتقد بأن هذا الرجل سينجح وسيأخذ فترة تانية هو حقق وحد يعني حلم يعني الصهيونية العالمية بالاعتراف بالقدس الشريف كعاصمة للصهيونية العالمية على أرض فلسطين وبالتالي هو حقق نصف الوعود الذي قطعها ولكن I should just make the point to you, uh, you, you may well know, uh, but the vast majority of the Israel lobby in the United States at this point in time is evangelical Christian. Uh, it, it, more Jews in America oppose Israel than have ever done, but the problem is there are 50 million evangelical Christian maniacs, we even found one on the streets of London, uh, who think that what Trump is doing is, uh, is biblical uh, prophecy, uh, trying to bring about the end of the world so Jesus can return. They want the end of the world as quickly as uh, possible. Gentlemen at the back. Can we all gather around and praise Donald Trump if you take a geopolitical view from American energy needs? Trump has managed to turn the position around from 1973, where the uh, Arabs put the price of oil up in response to the war in the Middle East, to the point now that he's chosen, he's been the kingmaker for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has now, will shortly give its oil resources to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. If you can take back, all right, it's a long time ago, but if you can cast your mind back far enough to when... Um, to 1974, the oil embargo. The oil embargo and everything. And now the Saudis are handing... They, the, Britain has been compliant for many years in, in supporting Saudi Arabia, the war in Yemen, targeting bombs, supplying bombs, training the Saudi military to, to do this. But Trump has gazumped Britain. He's taken, he's taken the high ground, he's taken Saudi oil, he's taken, uh, the, he, it's this a genius. The privatization a of Aramco you're talking about. The privatization of Aramco. So you're saying it's going to be the New York Stock Exchange rather than the London. And the London Stock Exchange. And this is the, the thing that's been lost in the, in the picture. I mean, uh, that, that's a useful lesson to it's the It's genius. Britain. It's absolute genius. The man is a fool, but he's a genius. He's managed to give the, the Arabs to give their oil to America for nothing and for the Americans to provide them with weapons which they're using on their own people. With this we know. And this the wisest is, fool in Christendom. Yeah. Is, is, is Trump, but he's a genius. He, you, you look at what's happened in Brazil. Brazil's been taken over by a CAA coup. The long-term American policy towards Brazil, Venezuela, Iran, Wesley Clark's speech, which was recorded, and uh, General Wesley Clark's speech of all the countries the Americans were going to bomb, and it all finalizes with Iran. He's, he's pushing that. He's, he made a change, but ultimately, Americans will still be driving four-wheel drive cars with four- and five-liter engines at cheap oil prices. I mean, he has put America first. He's made, he hasn't made America necessarily great again, but he has put America first. Well, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Let's take this gentleman in the middle, please. Yes, I was just going to say, George, this is what uh, puts me in a bit of a bind about Trump, because as a, as a person, as a human being, I think he is fairly deplorable, and I think he is totally unprincipled. And, of course, I, I condemn, like most people here, the you know, recognition of Jerusalem as the capital. I think that was totally, you know outrageous and not not too surprising after all the other outrageous things he said but this is what puts me in a bind george as you were right to identify hillary clinton would have escalated the war in syria probably would have helped intensify the conflict in eastern ukraine 
more so, much more so than Donald Trump. Don't get me wrong, I'm disappointed with Donald Trump that he's continued to hurl sanctions at Russia and basically continue to work as his predecessors. But I've n I have little doubt that Hillary Clinton would have intensified the, the conflict in eastern Ukraine a lot t to the max. And that's what puts me in a bind. Granted, she probably was less likely to recognise Jerusalem as the capital, at least this early, it had she won the election even though many other presidents before her had vowed to do it. It's Including just... Obama. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, and that's what puts me in the bite. I don't know what you think about that, George, but... No, I, I think that uh, all of that is uh, accurate, uh, that Hillary Clinton would have been more dangerous on the two main fronts of Syria and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's a point that we should really only whisper it would have been much more difficult to mobilize the world against President Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, foul uh, desires and designs than it is to mobilize the world against Donald Trump. Maybe as an anti-American campaigner, I'm merely being uh, selfish on that. Let's take the gentleman at the back. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, so I think there are a few issues. First is Trump is an arrogant control freak. He disrespects everyone, but in particular women. women. There are so many allegations have come across, uh, 17 I think, uh, who have come out in public. More than 100 Congress members have requested for an investigation by Congress. I don't know where it's going to go. And the hypocrisy of uh, the justice when uh, there's different rules for other celebrities and for American president can just get away with anything and everything. With regard to Jerusalem, uh, it is condemnable, but it's not a surprise. America has been, never been a honest broker with regard to Israel and Palestine. The negotiations were not going anywhere. They're grabbing land after land. Effectively, Jerusalem is Israel's capital, if you look at it. So I think his rash decision hopefully will bring out at least Muslim masses on the capitals and all over the world in Europe to push their leaders, who are puppets of America anyways, who are not going to do anything except kissing, giving some minor statements here and there. And maybe that way there could be some sort of resistance against his stupid Just policies. don't hold your breath on that one, yeah? Yes, I won't. Because but, that could be fatal. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else here? The lady in the middle. The question of uh, this episode, is America great again? America would be great if we are weak. And uh, I still remember your, uh, you know, one of your episodes, you said we are, as Arab, we are one, uh, you know, we can be one nation, we have one language, we have uh, one uh, religion, and uh, if we, are, we can unite, we can, we can be more powerful, and that will, will weaken Americans' influence, especially in the Middle East. And I think his decision uh, about Palestine is, is going to make America less powerful because it uh, united a lot of the people and uh, wake, uh, woke them up that Palestine is the main issue, especially after uh, access of uh, the resistance won uh, against the uh, terrorism uh, in uh, Syria and Iraq. And uh, also because the people realized that uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and uh, lots of the Gulf states are supporting uh, Israel, they used to support it, you know, behind the scene, and now it, it's in the open. So they can see clearly what's happening. They can see clearly that they are pro-American and they are working against uh, Palestine and against them as, an, as uh, their own people as well. And we, we saw that uh, the Bahraini government sent sent delegation to uh, Israel, to, to the occupied territory. So now uh, these people can see also that uh, Wahhabism is, is uh, Zionism. That's what we can, we can uh, say about it as well. So uh, I think this is a turning point. Um, uh, people around the, the Arab world, especially uh, the Muslim, uh, I think they can unite to support Palestine. And this is the main issue. If they unite, we, America will lose its influence in the uh, Middle East. And if, lost, if it lost uh, its influence, it's going to lose uh, the power and uh, the resources, which is uh, the oil, and it will mm. get weaker and weaker. Mm. Inshallah. Uh, but as I always say, if my auntie had a beard, she'd be my uncle. 
Uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the first point, uh, the great Irish revolutionary leader James Larkin used to say that the great only appear to be great as long as the rest of us are on our knees. So what is required is for the Arabs and the Muslims to get off their knees. Now Jerusalem, I hope, I pray, uh, will be the cause of the Arab world getting off its knees. But after, uh, after 45 years of fighting alongside the Arabs and having a lot of holes in my back where they stabbed me in the back, I, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not as confident about that as uh, you are. Uh, but if they don't rise up for Jerusalem, what are they going to uh, rise up for? They might as well allow uh, men into their wives' uh, bedroom. Uh, this is the uh, ultimate challenge uh, for the Muslims. But to me, the Muslims are more interested in killing each other, slaughtering each other in industrial quantities, uh, in the most uh, foul ways. Children in Yemen are literally starving to death as we speak. They're dying of cholera. Uh, they are being massacred by bombs. And all of the bombs are being dropped by Arabs on Arabs. In Syria, we've just had six years of mainly Arabs, some other Muslims from places like this and elsewhere, massacring hundreds of thousands of other Arabs and other Muslims. And although they have been defeated now, Thanks to the uh, Syrian Arab army and the uh, president of Syria and the allies that he was able to bring together, keep together, the war is not over. It's only <coughs> metamorphosed and moved uh, into different forms in different uh, places. This sickness of sectarianism where you are, you, you are ready to kill a million uh, people from a different sect of Islam uh, from you, but you're not prepared to pick up a stone to liberate Al-Aqsa, I don't think that sickness has gone away. The last segment coming up after this. with me, George Galloway, in London, with all these experts and enthusiastic amateurs. It's been a great debate this evening. Let's take the young gentleman there on the end. Hi, my name is Pai. I'm, I'm from London. Uh, I just wanted to make two or three points. Um, first is the election when um, he uh, stood against uh, Hillary Clinton, who had blood on her hands uh, when she was serving in Obama's administration. Uh, anyone could have won that race because she took the place of Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders should have been there for that election. So although Trump was, there were accusations of sexual harassment against him, we all heard him on the tape and the things that he said. Now this is President of United States. Uh, he still managed to beat her because she have innocent uh, people's blood on her hands. So that's one point. Uh, another point is the gentleman said uh, Quds belongs to Jewish, so America belongs to Red Indians. What are you going to do about that? Are you going to kick them out now? So for you to go back 3,000 years, it's just you uh, are not being unrealistic, it's unjustified, and we might as well just get up and start killing each other because thousands of years ago, uh, our ancestors were not here. So why it's might as well just start kill us and kick us out? So that, that's just, just been unreasonable and unrealistic. So that's First of all, we no longer call them Red Indians. Uh, they're not Red and they're not Indians. Uh, they were the original American people who were genocidally uh, eliminated, annihilated, from 10 million down to 100,000 in uh, 1900. Can you believe that? 10 million to 100,000. Uh, uh, of course, the idea that God is an estate agent 
who promised someone 3,000 years ago that they could have uh, this city uh, is uh, nonsensical, unless you believe. Uh, it's not Trump because I don't think he believes in any religion, uh, but the people who are supporting him surely do, and they believe they want to bring about the end times, uh, to bring about the uh, end of, uh, of humanity and the, uh, the rapture, as they call it, uh, ironically, at which all the Jews will have to be killed uh, unless they convert to Christianity. Uh, so you could say that these people are supporting Israel as the rope supports the hanging man. Let me turn to uh, the man who should have been the Prime Minister but was twice the Mayor of London. Uh, I don't actually agree with the point that was made by the gentleman at the back that uh, all of these developments have, been, have shown uh, that Trump and the US is in the driving seat. To me, like you, a lifelong opponent of American imperialism, America looks weaker to me than it uh, ever has. It's not a paper tiger, of course, still a tiger, but its teeth are falling out uh, a little bit. Its hair is beginning to uh, come out in tufts. What's your view on that? Well, I think the simple reality is that at the end of the Second World War, almost half the global economy was in the United States of America. And in the decades that followed that, they could set the agenda for the world. I mean, not just overthrowing governments all over the place, like in Brazil in 64, in Chile, in Africa, in the, the, the Caribbean, but eventually managing to destroy the Soviet Union. And then you had a period when America was identifying uh, Muslims as the problem and the threat. Now they fear the growth of China. And what worries me in all of this is that just the scale of nuclear weapons around the world, the more and more political leaders who seem to be irrational and unbalanced, eh, not just Trump, eh, this looks like a much more dangerous world than it was in the, you know, the days of Eisenhower and Kennedy and Khrushchev and so on. But the one thing that inspires me is, as the, the gentleman there said, if Bernie Sanders had got the Democratic nomination, he would be the president. He would be resetting the whole American and global agenda. And the way in which Jeremy Corbyn came within just 2% uh, of overtaking the Conservatives here, I think in the West a lot of people are waking up to the fact we've been lied to all our lives. And all of this is about a small elite rich great corporations, screwing all the rest of us, sucking the money up to them and overthrowing governments like in Iran in 1953 that wanted to use Iranian oil for the Iranian people, right the way across the world. It's about a small elite and I think more and more people are becoming aware of this and that anger could turn into progressive governments that change the world. There was an interesting comment made in the Vox Pops by a young woman on the streets of London there. Uh, when she said, America doesn't look as nice as it used to look. When we were growing up, watching the television, watching the movies, America did look nice. And soft power is important, isn't it? You can have thousands of rockets, you can have uh, all the military paraphernalia, but if people don't like you, if people don't think that what you represent is attractive and something worth supporting and following, uh, then you are in a serious problem. Do you think that Trump is, in a sense, the, the end point of America's soft power decline? Well, yeah, I'm, I remember growing up thinking, oh, I'd love to be able to go to America for a holiday and all of that, and it looked amazing. And then, you know, every president since I became politically aware has lied and deceived. I mean, remember... Lyndon Johnson was elected in 64 saying we're not going to have a war in Vietnam. He went on and unleashed a war that killed three and a half million Vietnamese. And I think increasingly we've seen that with so many of the other presidents coming along and people are beginning to recognise this. Um, but we've reached the worst. I mean, there's not the slightest doubt about that. I mean, whereas a lot of people around the world were excited and thought President Johnson was doing great things initially, from the beginning, 
I mean, people around the world and in America are looking at a president who's being bloody awful from day one. And therefore, I think there's a real chance of his being removed, but not just him going, but a more progressive um, a re regime coming in America because so many people are seeing their chances for their children to get a decent job or a decent home, like here in Britain, are less and less as all the wealth is sucked up to that small one-tenth of one percent. It is an important point that you make, the narrowness of uh, the, the majority of the elite's uh, power. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn came within 2% of defeating the Conservatives here in Britain. Bernie Sanders had to be cheated out of the Democratic Party's nomination, and if he had won it, would almost certainly have beaten uh, Trump. So all is not lost, is it? Oh, no, all is not lost. It's just a very dangerous world we're in at the moment. But that means ordinary people, I, you and me, we've got to be out there telling people the truth. The Internet's become a very good way of actually getting across to people what's going on. I mean, the whole world watched 600,000 Rohingya Muslims being driven out of Myanmar and there was outrage around the world. But there are millions of people in the West who still do not know that that's exactly what happened to the Palestinians. 700,000 in those days driven out uh, by terrorism or driven out at the, uh, uh, with guns um, pointing at the, the back of their head. And we need to make sure people know and understand that. Again and again, when I'm watching Western television, all I see is people defending the state of Israel, blaming it all on the Palestinians, saying, why won't the Palestinians um, come and, to peace? Well, the reason is because they're still living in appalling conditions in Gaza and in refugee camps. And we're set nearly 70 years on. I mean, the, the first Prime Minister of Israel, when he was questioned, about you know, the problem uh, of the refugees. And w one or two progressive Israelis were saying we should allow some to come back, help establish the others. He said, don't worry, the old will die and the young will forget. Well, the great-grandchildren of the young haven't forgotten. They're there and they're angry. But I want everybody in the West to know that truth. And I'm afraid, given the bias of our media, the vast majority, I think, don't. Mm. Alexander, uh, when you hear Ken and others this evening, uh, telling us about all the places that the United States has interfered in. It must make you, I don't know, laugh or cry or both. The idea that Russia interfered in America's election uh, by, by placing ads on Facebook, while America has invaded half the world, occupied half the world, subverted and overthrown governments by the dozen, uh, why don't Russians actually say that? Uh, I, I long for Mr. Lavrov to say, what do you mean interfere in elections? What, what have you been doing for the last half century? Well, first of all, I need to say something that um, I think the people in the Muslim world don't really grasp at the moment. First of all, the question about Jerusalem and the American policy in the Middle East. The Russian academics understood that back in the 80s, and I was talking to them. And they said, what the Muslim Arab world doesn't understand is that the Israel is the fall guy of the Wall Street in the Middle East. The Muslims need to understand something. This is a game America is playing. America has a vast machine behind this policy of Hollywood, now even computer games, the internet and everything. You are being fooled, people by these technological uh, assets. America has this vast machine on its side. It can look at, look at the way this Russian gate was played out. This was played out because America has the scientific, the technological advantage, and it manipulates the world. That's the point. The biggest enemy of Israel is the United States. The main enemy of the Muslim world and the Arab world is sitting at Wall Street. But nobody understands that. Now, the way things are played out now by the Americans is that they know they have Hollywood, which will brainwash hundreds of millions of people every Saturday, every Friday, every Sunday when they go to watch it, because it is the fifth column of the American government. Every film that comes out from Hollywood, even the superhero films, has American propaganda in it. 
And this is why I see young Muslims with mobile phones, with iPads, they're already being manipulated by this machine. And this is why I see the way out of this situation, is that religious leaders in the Muslim world need to explain, especially to the young people, that this is a war against them. With this mobile phone, with this iPad, they're being brainwashed. They need to resist it. They need to understand what's going on. And I think this is why they're getting away with it. I mean, the American government and the American establishment. They are manipulating the whole world. In Russia, young people are walking around staring at the mobile phones. They're playing these computer games where the American soldiers are the heroes. And I say to them, guys, if you watch an American film, the bad guys are the good guys in that film. But you need to understand this. And the same comes about the Muslim people and the Arab people. They need to understand this. And once they do start to understand this, we might start winning. A friend of mine has just made a film uh, in which Superman lands not in the United States, but on a collective farm in the Ukraine. And instead of the S on his uh, chest, he has the hammer and sickle. And instead of building truth, justice, and the American way, he helped Stalin build socialism in the USSR. And believe it or not, that film is going to be made in Hollywood. Nadja, uh, finally from you, uh, what would be your verdict on 12 months of Trump? And where will we be 12 months from now if Trump is still in power from a Middle East perspective? لأبدأ من إيران أولا أعتقد بإمكان السيد ترامب تصحيح أخطاءه في العلاقة مع إيران تحديدا وخصوصا فيما يتعلق بالملف النووي في الاتفاقية النووية حتى هذه اللحظة الأمم المتحدة تحديدا الأمم المتحدة الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة وطبعا الوكالة الدولية للطاقة الذرية وأيضا الاتحاد الأوروبي وزيرة الخارجية في الاتحاد الأوروبي فيدريكا موغريني كلهم أكدوا التزام إيران بشكل صارم بالاتفاق النووي هذا يعني أن هناك فرصة لترامب لكي يعود إلى حضن الاتفاق النووي ولا يتلاعب بالألفاظ إيران تنقض روح الاتفاق النووي بداية الحل مشاكل الشرق الأوسط هو بالانفتاح على إيران وأيضا بحل الأزمة الرئيسة بين إيران وبين المملكة العربية السعودية أنا أعتقد أن ترامب يخطئ كثيرا وسيرتكب أكبر حماقاته إذا استمر الصراع بين إيران والمملكة العربية السعودية بالشكل الحالي أو إذا اعتمد ترامب ما سمي آنذاك بخطة مارتن أنديك مارتن أنديك احتواء زعامات شيعية في العراق عن طريق المملكة العربية السعودية واعتماد العراق كمنصة لمحاربة إيران أو لتقليل من النفوذ الإيراني إيران ستبقى في العراق على سياسيا لديها علاقات سياسية معنوية على الرغم من أن النفوذ الإيراني في العراق بشكل خاص هو أقل بكثير من النفوذ التركي مثلا النفوذ التركي في, في العراق وهذه فرصة كبيرة أمام السيد ترامب في الاثنى عشر شهر القادمة أن ينفتح على إيران ويقيم علاقات جيدة مع إيران ويحل مشكلة اليمن حلا جذريا عن طريق طبعا الضغط على المملكة العربية السعودية للرضوخ إلى مفاوضات بين اليمنيين والإيرانيون أعلنوا عن رغبتهم واستعدادهم عن طريق وزير الخارجية محمد جواد ظريف استعدادهم لإطلاق حوار يمني يمني it's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you from all of us here in London this evening. Good night.